Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. Linda Sheely, founding partner of Sheely Law, discusses the importance of ethics in plaintiff law and her experience consulting on topics like advertising, non-attorney firm partners, and CLE programs. Hi, Linda. Thanks so much for sitting down with me today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, thanks for taking time out of your schedule. I know it's uh, quite busy around the holidays and uh, a great time of the year, but a greatly busy time of the year. We're trying to be festive. Yeah, well, you've succeeded. Absolutely. I I need to work on my color scheme. But um, so I'd like to start, you know, pretty basic and easy, but I I love talking to people. And that's part of partly why I conduct some of these interviews. But I would love to know how it is that you chose ethics or perhaps ethics chose you. Um, The real answer is because we had a two-year-old at home and newborn twins over 30 years ago. And um, when I became outnumbered at home, I went to a friend at the State Bar of Arizona out here that I knew and, and said, I will literally do anything you want as long as I can have a few minutes by myself without small children. And created the State Bar of Arizona Ethics Hotline 30 years ago. And after that, um, worked it there for 10 years answering ethics questions on on the ethics hotline and then 20 years ago decided i i could do this for money so i started my own law firm um, and now have advised a a little over 2,000 law firms around the country on legal ethics and it's just a delight i work with good lawyers who are just trying to do the right thing yeah so so tell me about that i think that uh, you know ethics is obviously something that lawyers learn about way early in law school, right? You've got the uh, the ethics exam, professional responsibility. It's sort of drilled into us. And then you start practicing. Um, and, and I guess, not that it's not important, but it's not necessarily top of mind, especially for those who are in bigger law firms, because someone else is usually looking out for the ethics. Um, What do you see most? Do you see lawyers coming to you ahead of time or after uh, shit hits the fan? Um, The the answer is yes. Um, So I see see both. I knew I liked you. (laughs) Preferably the first, um, because I don't actually handle defending people in discipline or legal malpractice cases. Um, my client firms understand that they it, it's far better if they ask first. You know, after you've been practicing a little while, you'll you'll get that feeling. You're like, is this right? Or something's off on this. And that's when you call the timeout, right? It is far cheaper and you're going to lose less sleep if you actually ask the question before you do something. So uh, most of the firms that I work with, uh, will call me asking a question and and it ranges the gamut, everything from frequently and, and probably the most common question are conflicts of interest. But I do everything from reviewing fee agreements, talking about confidentiality, training staff, because a lot of mistakes or, or ethics violations occur because staff haven't been trained in what the ethical requirements are. Um, And then I will answer questions because sometimes you just don't know. And and sometimes clients or opposing parties might allege things against you. And and then I help lawyers try to work through difficult situations. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, so I've been a litigator, so I've certainly had allegations thrown around. There are just some lawyers who don't, I don't know, maybe they have a different set of ethics rules um, than we all do. But, But certainly... Things get in your head and then you think, oh, maybe that's maybe that's an issue that I haven't even thought about yet. Um, but tell me about um, about this. I guess lawyer lawyers or law firms that have you on retainer obviously have ethics on in mind. Right. And want to do things the right way. Do you find yourself um, and I know you interface with the bar and, and there's a, a you know strong connection there. Obviously, you're well known, you're well respected. But are there places where, let's say, the ethics rules 
are outdated or don't actually address the problems at issue where you're seeing lawyers struggle because there's sort of a misfit? There are probably several places because like any set of regulations, you know, things change over time. And those regulations need to be flexible enough to adapt or they need to be changed. Um, probably one of the, the most common areas where I see frustration by lawyers uh, will be lawyer advertising. Um, you know, fees and, and things like that and conflicts, yes, we always see those issues. Um, but particularly for anybody who advertises for clients, and if you happen to advertise, I don't know, on the internet, um, the fact that the rules vary by state and your pesky website covers all states and the whole globe, it is challenging for lawyers to figure out, okay, which rules do I have to apply and how do I, how do I comply with 50 states different advertising regulations? So that's one area where um, we see a, a lot of issues and I try to work through with firms figuring out, okay, if you're going to be advertising or you're going to be taking on a national ad campaign, hypothetically, um, you know, how, it, how are you going to work that to comply with the states where you need to? Right. The, yeah, the internet uh, really changed. <laughs> I think tech and law, right? You know, technology changes and the law is like, wait for me. Um, so, you know, certainly that's, uh, that's an issue that we see a lot. Um, and then you've got, you know, lawyers who maybe are doing the best they can without seeking guidance. Uh, and, and those who follow the rules are left with like, I don't know, Florida's like what the law books or a blue background. That's the, the sort of generic, um, imagery. And, and so, uh, that's tough. I mean, how does, one and a lot of lawyers these days are, are admitted in numerous states, um, specifically Arizona being one of them. Sometimes DC, Utah. Um, but how do lawyers actually comply with all of the rules that they need to? Are they are, are the rules? I know there are differences, but can that even be done? Uh, you can try really hard, and yes, you you can comply for the most part by picking which jurisdictions really the predominant effect of, of your actions will occur. And actually, I'll give my only disclaimer um, that I serve as the chair of the ABA's Ethics Committee, but I am not speaking on behalf of the American Bar Association today. Have to give that disclaimer. Um, but we're right now working on an ethics opinion to help lawyers figure out, okay, I'm admitted in D.C. and Florida. Which rules apply in any situation? My fee agreement or my advertising, or if I have a duty of confidentiality that differs in most states. So we try to provide some guidance. And of course, everybody knows that every state has an ethics hotline and has, for the most part, most states have um, ethics opinions. And Florida certainly has a great guidebook on um, lawyer advertising. So you can walk through every scenario there to get some guidance. Yeah, it's, um, it's certainly an interesting topic to look at from a journalistic perspective. Um, but I could imagine as an attorney that would be advertising, it's extraordinarily frustrating, um, you know, that sort of misfit, right, where it doesn't catch up. Um, it's, I'm happy to hear that uh, steps are being taken to try to, you know, to bridge that gap. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and hopefully things, you know, proceed in that, you know, down that path. Uh, I think that would be a much better place for lawyers to be. Um, you know, I, I, ideally we would have uniform rules, right? Because of the internet, it would be sure. wonderful, at least for advertising, if we could have one set of uniform rules across the U S but each state has different reasons why they have particular issues they want to regulate. So as long as lawyers sure. are doing the best they can to comply with the states where they think they reasonably should be complying Hopefully they'll be okay. Yeah, no, I know. I think so. And, and certainly this is an interesting area that we'll be developing, uh, in my opinion, heavily over the next few years. But you know, sim this is similar to internet law, uh, internet jurisdictional issues. I mean, there is no one uniform law. It's really, really difficult um, and, and not dangerous, but um, you know, virtually impossible to, to get it all right. Um, and of course, the court's 
still need to be educated. Anytime there's new technology, um, you know, new uh, ways of, of business being done that involve the internet or technology, then you've, there's got to be an educational component. Um, do you know whether any of the state bars, whether Arizona or otherwise, or the ABA are actively looking at trying to learn about how, how let's say, internet advertising works, like the technology behind it? Um, are there any efforts to 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 look into that? That's, that's a great question because I'm not sure if there are any bar associations that are specifically looking into the technology of, for instance, lawyer advertising in the internet. Um, although the ABA, which creates the model rules, um, the ABA amended the advertising rules a few years ago, um, and we were involved with that to try to update a little bit. And then several states have adopted um, some of those changes to kind of streamline a little bit, because the bottom line is, at least for lawyer advertising on, on the internet or anywhere else, just don't lie. <laughs> you know, it's not hard. Don't, don't lie. Don't guarantee results. Don't create false expectations. And you should be okay. I know. Yeah. Part, part of a, I have this conversation several times a week, sometimes a day. Uh, but, you know, when, when lawyers outsource advertising, um, and, and, you know, this is just the way it is that the bar has jurisdiction over the lawyer, not necessarily the advertising entities. Um, it, can you talk about what the risks are of, let's say, we'll stick on internet advertising because that's where we are, but for internet advertising and how that plays out? Sure. And actually, the, the American Bar Association issued an ethics opinion this past year, um, which is available online to everybody, and it's opinion 501. And it does give some guidance, which I think would be very useful, particularly for personal injury mass tort lawyers um, in solicitation. What can be done for you and what can't be done? Because lawyers, I hope, know that if you hire a marketing company or if you hire a lead generation company or whatever you want to call them, an SEO company, you, the lawyer, are responsible for whatever they do for you. So there is a, a, a huge gap sometimes because lawyers you know, should hire somebody who is more experienced and understands SEO and, and online marketing and, and lead generation. That's great. But you, the lawyer, have an obligation to make sure that you tell those people how they can advertise. You can't have somebody creating a website that says, I guarantee I will get you a million dollars, to use an easy example. But if you don't, as the lawyer, supervise and review what that person is doing for you, you are going to be disciplined. If a, a lead generation company starts cold calling people, Mrs. Smith, so sorry to hear that your husband just passed away. You know what? You're right. The lead generation company is not going to be disciplined. The lawyer is going to be disciplined if they take on that client for the impermissible solicitation. Sure. And, you know, ultimately the lead generation company would lose the clients and would be out of business. So everyone loses in that scenario. But I think it's an important thing to think about. Um, you know, lawyers often think about what, you know, what the outcome is, pros and cons, but the risk reward here is really, you know, important to think about, certainly. Um, one of the other trends that I know you're very aware of uh, more recently is having non-lawyer ownership in law firms. Uh, Arizona being one of the states, several others, um, can you talk a little bit about that and, um, and, you know, we'll sort of dig in a little bit, but what does that actually mean um, when non-lawyers are, are owners? So we, we have ethics rules in every jurisdiction except Arizona and kind of Utah and kind of D.C. in every U.S. jurisdiction that prohibit non-lawyers from having any ownership or equity interest in a law firm. And we also have a rule that says that lawyers cannot share fees with non-lawyers. Let's just pause for a second there because that model rule, model rule 5.4, which every jurisdiction in the U.S. has for the most part, let's think about that. How are you all paying the salaries of your staff? 
oh, wait, yeah, you're paying it from fees that you earn. But sarcasm aside, every jurisdiction in the U.S. has this prohibition. And Arizona actually wasn't the first state to change. D.C. changed their rules back in the 90s. And they have permitted non-lawyer partners, individuals though, not passive investment by litigation funding companies or hedge funds or anything, only an individual who would be a non-lawyer could be a partner in a DC law firm. That's been around for years. And then back in 2021, both Utah and Arizona um, have different projects, but both permit now non-lawyer ownership. Utah has a sandbox, which think of pilot project. They have a pilot project, which is very different than Arizona. It permits people to apply to be in this pilot project and have non-lawyer owners, or even in Utah, non-lawyers can provide certain legal services. Again, that's a different, just Utah project. In Arizona, um, our court, our Supreme Court, which regulates the practice of law here, eliminated that ethics rule 5.4 altogether. So they eliminate 5.4, but that doesn't mean that non-lawyer investors, marketing companies, aggregators, or accountants can come in and just own a law firm. There is a very detailed application process, kind of like what we all go through for character and fitness when we apply to be a lawyer in a state. An ABS, an alternative business structure law firm in Arizona, must go through a very detailed background check to find out who owns it and what what's the background of each of the people who will be in a decision-making position in that firm. And Arizona's project does not permit the non-lawyers, the, the hedge fund, the venture capitalist, the accountant, does not permit them to practice law. They are just providing either other professional services like an accountant or a financial planner or an engineer cybersecurity expert, they cannot practice law. And they also can't control the lawyer's independent professional judgment. And I know that's, that's where we see the pushback in most jurisdictions. People are concerned, understandably, that they don't want non-lawyers coming in and controlling how the lawyer decides which clients to take or how to practice law. They don't want decisions made. So some accountant or, or bookkeepers telling the lawyer, no, you can't take any depositions because that's too expensive. The rules in Arizona prohibit that. The non-lawyers in the firm cannot control the lawyer's independent professional judgment. But they can provide, let's say, you know, business strategy advice that wouldn't overlap with, with legal advice, not strategy relating to how many depots should you take, but, you know, maybe should we expand into this area of law or, you know, do such and such? Is it better to, uh, you know, take out a loan here or something like that? Um, you know, be an active participant. Is that something that's permissible and, or required? It, that's exactly one of the reasons that the Arizona Supreme Court eliminated Rule 5.4 and put in this ABS law firm application process and, and review process was so that lawyers could partner with other professionals to help them. And this was seen as a, hopefully a benefit to lawyers. So, right, lawyers aren't necessarily really good business people, right? I'm not going to so, quote you on that, but can you say that again? No, I'm kidding. I, I, I don't disagree with you. <laughs> I don't disagree so, with you. You know, if you have a firm administrator or if you have a CFO of your law firm who is a, is just in that, they're, they're crucial, why not let them have? decision-making authority right. over the areas where they're experienced and they are the best in class professional that you could have. Right. No, I, I think I completely agree with that. Um, do you, can you talk a little bit about the, the Genesis? So, so I understand, and, and please correct me, you're the expert here that the DC rule had to do with lobbying and the political nature of the DC environment. Um, I can't speak to Utah so much, but what was the Genesis of why Arizona came out with this really, really, I mean, clearly there's a lot of woman and maybe man hours put into it, right? <laughs> um, no, but but what was the, why? Why now and, and what, what pushed this? Well, both Utah and Arizona 
um, started task forces around the same time, and those came out of actually the Conference of Chief Justices, which is the organization of all the chief justices from all the U.S. jurisdictions, came out with a recommendation that basically said, look, states, we're not doing it. We are not meeting the demand for legal services, and you all need to think about innovative ways to get legal services out there. And Utah really um, created their pilot project, their sandbox, as an access to justice matter, um, looking at ways to reduce the cost of legal services and, and maybe even provide more legal service providers, not just lawyers. Arizona had a task force that basically did the same thing, but went a different direction. So we have um, at least two things that came out of the 2020 task force. One was creating another category of legal service providers, which are legal paraprofessionals. And that really was designed to deal with the access to justice issue, providing another pr provider um, other than just lawyers, hopefully at a lower price point in certain practice areas. But the ABS program is both so hopefully it gives some options to lawyers that might actually be able to invest in technology that would reduce the cost of legal services that they might be able to invest in marketing to get more information out there to consumers about the fact that they even have a legal issue and also to partner with other professionals that lawyers routinely collaborate with so it wasn't just access to justice arizona was also looking at um, and, and we started our conversation talking about rules that might be out of date. Right. Our court looked at, and the task force looked at this rule and said, no, wait a minute. All right. So you can't partner with a non-lawyer because why? And that's where they paused. And, and we looked at, are there other rules that will protect a lawyer's independent professional judgment? So nobody's going to tell me how to practice law, but will also let me have investors or other people help my practice and, and hopefully help my clients. Right, right. That's interesting that, that technology was such a big focus. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of technology out there. Every day it's changing, whether it's, you know, I think it's, I wouldn't call it failing. I would say like not quite getting there yet, but, you know, there's lots of chances that lawyers or, or the non-lawyers are taking to try to see if there's more that can be done, if there's more uh, targeted advertising that would be more efficient. Um, and, you know, I, I do think that part of the problem is the, let's just say, few attorneys or, or non-attorneys that are putting ads out there without attorney review, right, that are just egregious, um, you know, just, you know, guaranteeing anything, frankly, you know, that's, that, that gives lawyers and specifically plaintiff's lawyers a bad reputation, um, on the advertising. And I think we can look at what happened with Camp Lejeune, um, without going into the politics and all the details of it, but, uh, it's really extraordinary. I, I can't get off some of these lists. Um, and you know, that's unfortunate because I think a lot of people benefited from, learning information that they wouldn't have been already, they wouldn't have otherwise known. Now, of course, everybody knows about it, um, but there are benefits and it's, it's, you know, I'm happy as a technology and law lover to see that happening. Um, so a the ABS is obviously a very unique structure. What specifically is Arizona looking for? I know, and I've looked through, um, you know, that reporting process, you know, they want details on how many Arizonians are helped, um, on who's, you know, what the backgrounds are. Are they looking for anything specifically, whether to allow those people in or, or not? I mean, I, I can imagine there's been a lot of applications and <laughs> increase in applications for membership in Arizona. Um, not saying it's good or bad, but, um, you know, there's, there's, it's a lot, there's a lot of moving and shaking, uh, recently. Um, there is, and, and I'm smiling because, wow, yes, we have had a lot of lawyers from out of state applying for admission on motion in Arizona, which is great for our economy, right? Uh, we're seeing a need there. There is absolutely a need. Our legal consumers are underserved. And the fact that our Arizona Supreme Court was willing 
to be innovators and take the challenge. Um, I don't know that they, and, and we have the Arizona Supreme Court, which ultimately approves each ABS. There's also before that an ABS committee, which I actually serve on. Um, and we review applications. And even before that, you have all the due diligence that the court staff does, right? The investigators do. Um, and I don't know that they that the court was specifically looking for certain people to come into the market or adopt ABS structures. Um, when I assisted the, the task force in, in amending these rules and, and thinking of the changes, I mean, we kind of looked at the broad spectrum of, okay, a lawyer who's a sole practitioner wants to make their spouse or their kids be able to inherit their interest in the firm. Okay, why can't we have that spouse as a partner to having your 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 office manager, or your CFO as a partner to then seeing investment from different avenues? And, um, you know, they've they've amended the rules. So anyone who satisfies the criteria in the ABS process can apply and should be licensed. So they're my understanding is they are not limiting it to a certain number of firms or a certain mm -hmm. number in certain practice areas. I, I would say the most surprising probably um, area would be the number of firms of personal injury and mass tort that have been licensed. And, you know, looking in hindsight is great, right? Um, looking at who wants to invest in firms and seeing a return on that. I guess it makes sense that you're talking about um, some large contingent fee cases right, probably. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, the contingent fee, like the nature of that requires money from somewhere, right? And whether it's litigation funding or you know, dad or whomever, um, it, it, it's a lot of output. And sometimes these cases, I mean, even non-contingent cases, litigations can last for years. So that, that makes sense. Um, and, and certainly a lot of investors are, uh, are looking at law firms, litigation funding is up. Um, I know that the the number of, I haven't looked um, too recently, I should have. The eight, the number of ABSs was what, 15, 16, uh, and then has increased from there. And it wasn't that many. 36 yeah. that are approved right now. Um, there are probably going to be another five that we'll be considering next week at our meeting. Um, not a lot because I think a couple of factors. Number one is that lawyers are really resistant to change. And <laughs> you don't say. <laughs> it, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but lawyers are understandably cautious about adopting this. Um, sure. And then the second thing is it takes a while to get through the application process. If you're doing due diligence on a whole bunch of people, as well as companies and and what their backgrounds are, have they been prosecuted for false or misleading things in their own profession? Um, have the principals in the company been uh, subject to sanction orders or bankruptcy or criminal convictions? That that whole background investigation takes a while. So I, I would say it's deliberate and we're actually kind of excited that there are 36 of them licensed so far. Yeah. Um, I'm going to, I'll ask you a question and if you can't answer, that's completely okay. I know that you're on the, t the, the committee to review. Um, do the reviews, uh, or the due diligence that's being performed, does it focus more on the attorneys or the non-lawyers or both? Both. It, it focuses, and this is all public record information. Um, when you see the applications, and by the way, anybody interested in applying, you can ask for a public record copy of the applications of some of the ABS law firms that have already been licensed. So you can see how they've answered these questions. Um, it's a very detailed process, and um, they do the background checks on everybody. And I should note that in Arizona for the ABS law firm, there must be a lawyer practicing law. There must be a compliance lawyer who is an Arizona lawyer. And think of that as the managing partner. This is the person whose license is on the line. If anybody, including the non-lawyers, um, violate the ethics rules and you know advertise or do marketing that they shouldn't um, have conflicts, things like that. 
Sure. And any law firm that's you know, taking that plunge should feel comfortable having a compliance lawyer on staff. Um, and I guess, uh, let's, let's see. So of the law firms that are coming in or, or joining, right? Because sometimes these are new law firms that are, are being built. Uh, do you, are you seeing a lot of them who have retained ethics counsel to guide them through the process? Um, or do they try on their own and then have to, you know, sort of revise? I'm just not sure how, how many law firms or lawyers out there are really looking for the kind of ethical guidance that, you know, for example, that you could provide. Well, a, a public record note um, in our November meeting of the ABS committee, one of my um, conditions for serving on the committee was that I'm an ethics lawyer and I still would like to be able to advise applicants because a lot of thought has gone into the application process of explaining how are you going to check for conflicts? How are you going to protect confidentiality? And of the seven applicants that we had on the November agenda, I recused I didn't vote on five of them. So maybe that gives you an idea. It, it, it's like anything. It's if you're doing your due diligence and you would like to do this correctly, it's a good idea to consult with, like I, I would never give it, people advice on how do you up your SEO? That's not my expertise, right? But, you know, knowing the ethics requirements, particularly for lawyers from out of state, from non Arizona lawyers who are interested in investing, um, that's a very careful line that you, you have to understand all the criteria there. Um, we have an ABA ethics opinion, ABA opinion 499, that says, for instance, a Florida lawyer, it doesn't specifically say Florida, we'll give you the disclaimer there, but a lawyer admitted in another jurisdiction that can't have non-lawyer partners in their law firm can still invest passively in an ABS, meaning you can invest in an, an Arizona ABS law firm like you can invest in a mutual fund or a restaurant or something else, but you cannot practice law or hold yourself out as a lawyer in an Arizona ABS law firm if your state doesn't permit you to practice law with non-lawyers. And that's, has that some, is that something that's come up more, I guess, more frequently as more applications are coming through? Uh, not surprising there. Um, do you expect any changes in those rules? Well, uh, I would be hopeful that, and I, I think other jurisdictions are waiting to see, which makes sense, how Arizona and Utah do, right. um, to see whether this is a huge fiasco or whether it's a great boon for lawyers and for consumers. So right, hopefully, right. hopefully other states will eventually decide, you know what, the, with appropriate safeguards in place to protect clients, this is doable. Yeah, and so um, when do you see that coming? I mean, this is what twenty twenty one, so it's 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 a baby, right? The project is is, is young. It, it'll take a few years to sort of see as it comes through. Um, do you know of any disciplinary actions for the ABSs that are in place now? Of well, of the ABS law firms and lawyers, the Arizona lawyers practicing in Arizona ABS law firms since 2021, there have been no bar complaints. Um, I mean, this is a highly regulated area. The people who are doing this uh, are working in ABS law firms have to have very detailed policies and procedures, which honestly every law firm should have, right? But you're speaking other, my language. <laughs> States don't require when you come, you graduate from law school in another state, you can hang your shingle and start practicing the next day, even if you've never practiced in a law firm. That's terrifying. Yes. Whereas for everyone. The, <laughs> yes. But the, the Arizona ABS law firms, because they are asked up front before they start practicing, okay, how are you going to protect confidentiality? Oh, have you thought about that? Have you thought about VPNs and two-factor authentication? Oh, have you thought about how you're going to check for conflicts? So I, I'm not surprised that we haven't seen any bar complaints in Arizona. Um, you know, and ABS law firms have existed in the UK and Australia for years. 
and they see the same thing. Um, they, those jurisdictions are saying, you know, the fact that they're partners with non-lawyers is really a non-issue when it comes to discipline. Yeah, I, 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 I love that we're going back and not, you know, us, although I'd love to take credit for that, but, you know, trying to look at, you know, what, so what, so what if a, a non-lawyer is a partner and um, I worked on access to justice issues for a long time, getting all of this money invested into law firms so that they can afford the technology and so they can do things right, to me seems like a great opportunity for the states that are allowing it. And of course, this wait and see approach, or we don't think it can be done approach, um, that's fine too. But I'm hopeful that there'll be a number of changes in in you know, the years to come. Um, it, good, you know, good changes. Um, you know, I don't know, maybe someone will create something more different than the, maybe the internet will become the reality we live in. And so it'll be not just internet advertising, but that's just advertising period. I mean, we don't know. Um, but I, I'm, I'm, we're all looking to see what happens here, certainly. And, uh, you know, in the meantime, there are a lot of attorneys who have been working, like, as you said, a, a long time on setting it up, setting up an ABS or, or, uh, a firm in some other state. What's the, um, the average length of time from, let's say, opening the application to getting approved? Once an application is filed, it's only taking a, a couple of months, you know, two to two to four, I would say is about four months is, is probably average. Um, and it's like anything, you know, like when you apply to be a lawyer, if you don't have all of your references spelled out, if you haven't listed every place where you've worked, then it takes a little bit longer. But um, our court staff are, are phenomenal. And they they are doing an incredible job at making this program be a success and, and working as diligently as they can. Um, the other thing is in Arizona, uh, our court didn't want lawyers having to pay for this program if they weren't interested in it. So it's hopefully going to be self-sustaining. And so the application fees are pretty high and that might be a barrier to some of the smaller firms applying just because it's, it's a $6,000 filing fee. And that that's pretty costly, but we do, we, we see ABS is in, we have some smaller firms where it's just a, a lawyer or two and a financial planner or an accountant. Um, and then we see some larger national companies that have come in and are applying. Um, it, it's a great opportunity for lawyers to have talent retention, right? Not that any of us are having trouble keeping good staff. Yes. Um, this is a, a great opportunity if you have very dedicated staff members to give them more of an incentive to stay with your firm if you're giving them a capital investment. That's interesting. And, and you know, you, you know that some of these, especially the, the smaller practices, have had their you know, admin, manager, uh, or executive assistant, which I think it should be like called queen or king, <laughs> whoever that person is, right? Um, with For years and years and years and years. And, and what a neat uh, way to, you know, to do that. And, and it's the same thing that happens on the business side. When you've got employees that have worked with you for years and years, you let them, you give them an equity interest, right? They have, they feel like they are uh, owning and building something and not just, you know, staff, which right. I, I've never understood that about firms who treat the staff any different than anyone else there. I, I, it, it's always blown my mind. I've been so grateful to the staff that have ever been able to keep up with me. And, and at the same time, like I, I, I we would all fall apart. Um, what about, so if I'm, uh, let's say I, I want to set up a law firm and, and have a non-lawyer owner, um, what are the benefits of uh, forming an ABS as opposed to you know, maybe playing in the sandbox in Utah or opening a DC firm? DC, well, DC's rule is very different um, because it will only, it doesn't allow passive investment. You can't have um, litigation funders having an ownership interest in a DC firm. So that would be a, a, a limiting model. And that's why we've actually seen some DC firms applying to be an ABS. 
Um, the Utah Sandbox is, is very different um, because it's a pilot project. I think some people are concerned about going into a pilot project where it, it might be sunsetted at some point. And I, I don't hear any interest in doing that, but that would be that would be the one concern there. And an ABS, um, I, I think it provides a great opportunity to have the capital investment that lawyers and firms frequently don't have, but need to stay competitive. Um, I, I'm even hearing it's interesting in mass tort and personal injury that um, with having an ABS as an option in lieu of getting a loan, which by the way, most financial, traditional financial institutions don't wanna loan money to contingent fee lawyers, right? And even if you have litigation funding, that means you have a loan that you have to pay back. Whereas if you have a litigation funder who's investing in your firm, they don't get paid until you do. So it, it's less pressure on the lawyers than you would even see in litigation funding. So I, I see the ABS as, as a great opportunity um, for somebody who wants to practice ethically um, and has a sense of innovation and creativity, but understands that, okay, having those non-lawyers invest, um, they're not going to tell me how to practice law. I'm, I'm going to be able to stand up to them. And, and that's something else that we have in the regulations that the compliance lawyer needs to have some experience in managing a firm. You can't just hire some brand new graduate to be your compliance lawyer. That's the one point. that just hung up the shingle, uh, you know, right. Right. That's, <laughs> Before that's, policy. that's a deal breaker. Don't go there. Yeah. Yeah. No. And I have to say, Linda, it's so refreshing to hear the way that you're talking about this, because a lot of the talk about non-lawyer ownership in firms, at least in lawyer spaces, or I guess the people that I talk to are somehow connected to, to law firms. It's just, it's a lot of negativity or, um, you know, just not thinking it's right. And it, it's really, I think it's wonderful um, to understand that the basis of this was from a good place and that you see the value in it. And obviously Arizona does. Uh, I know there are other ethicists around the country that do, um, but I've got to thank you for, for sharing that perspective here, because I think a lot of plaintiff's lawyers needed to hear it. <laughs> not to mention, um, of course, we'll be sharing your contact information with them. But, um, you know, I think attorneys who have maybe who have not dealt with their own ethics counsel uh, and not an ethics, uh, you know, investigation or being accused of something, they don't understand the value in that because it's not saying, you know, you're not being hired to say, yes, you can do that. No, you can't do that. It's it's more complicated than that, right? It's, 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 let me, let me help you understand so you can make decisions. And I, and I think it's, um, it, it's just so important these days, especially in this, this changing world that we're living in where my goodness, there are so many active mass torts, um, and different situations that are coming up. Um, and given the world that we live in, I just expect this to increase. Um, it's not certainly not going anywhere. Um, Anything else that you wanted to share before we wrap up? I know I've taken so much of your time this morning, but again, so grateful. Well, I, I appreciate being here and, and having a, a positive light on this. I mean, it's an option and I encourage lawyers, look into it. Um, I, I appreciate the concerns, but we really tried hard in Arizona to put some safeguards in place and take a look at the at the applications that have been filed and, and take a look at who's in the space to see this is an exciting opportunity for lawyers. It's just yeah. one, one more tool in the tool belt for lawyers. It really is. And again, Linda, thank you so much. Uh, and uh, we might have to speak to you again down the road when there are some changes in place, but um, thank you for all the work that you do. Uh, I, I know it certainly <laughs> hasn't been easy and maybe you're in the shadows, um, but I think ethics attorneys are in the spotlight these days and it will just keep growing brighter. So thank you so much for spending the time with Master News. Thanks so much for having me.